Good afternoon, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming back to um, to the third day of the the Fringe Festival, Tronos at the Fringe. Um, it's a wonderful festival, and we've all been having some really exciting times. The the, the first weekend has really gone with with absolute dynamism. Uh, it's been wonderful, and that, of course, is because it's the people of Tronos. The people of Tronos come and participate, and they make this festival their own. Um, but I'm very pleased to say that running alongside the festival, we have a residency and we have a, a group of international writers who are working together, collaborating at the same time as the festival is going on. And so it's great that they can contribute something to the programme. All those writers, it just so happens this year, are academics. They're all professors of creative writing and at a higher level they are, they are teaching creative writing. But we put that aside when they come here today because I'm going to introduce my, my dear friend Derek Coyle who uh, teaches in St. Patrick's College in Carlow in Ireland. But apart from that, apart from working nine to five and teaching the process, he is in literature, he is in the community and he embeds writing in the community of Ireland and, and works with the people. And um, his, his work with the Carlow writers Cooperative, cooperative, yeah. Because we were thinking, we were talking the other day about the word collective and cooperative, and how it brings brings people, uh, how it truly represents what people are doing collaboratively and together for the benefit of each other, um, to, to 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 make a better world, to make better writers of each other. So so Derek, back home, is very involved in that, and I'm going to stop talking now and I'm going to let him start talking. And once he starts talking, it'll be very difficult to stop him. But he's going to tell you. He's going to tell you more about his work with the with the Carlo Writers Cooperative. Yeah, brilliant. Thank thanks, you, Dominic. Dominic. There we go. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, thanks to Dominic uh, Cultivira and the good people of Tramas and our international friends for giving me this opportunity. And just to say, in many ways, actually, that it was my work or our work in the cooperative that probably has actually brought me here to you today. And I have to say, from my end anyway, it's been a very uh, fortuitous uh, and uh, welcome, and I'm sure, and I know it, a very creative uh, encounter. Uh, uh, I'll say just a little bit about cooperative first, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna read in the course of the talk and talk about the idea of the cooperative, its ideals, some of how it kind of, fun how it functions, what it's aspiring to achieve, what it has achieved. I have a proposition for Tranos and other Swedish towns based on this model. But in the course of it, I'm gonna spice or pepper the talk with selections of uh, reading from a number of cooperative members that they've passed on to me and I'll introduce each member and say a bit about them uh, as I read the work and I'll read one, read one piece of mine uh, in the course of uh, this uh, uh, afternoon as well. So the cooperative was founded in 2009, I think, thereabouts in the mythic hazy past. It did sort of arise from the ashes of another group that kind of splintered. It's that old cliche that the splintering of one group can lead to the birth of another. Uh, it was founded by a, a gentleman called Porig Brennan and myself in 2009. He's a sort of fantasy writer, uh, writes short stories, and increasingly uh, a filmmaker uh, in the Carlo uh, area. Now, it's founded on the belief that uh, uh, people can write, that uh, uh, the ordinary man and woman on the street, let's say, has a story to tell and can tell a story and if introduced to certain formal methods or means uh, uh, can learn over time uh, how to articulate themselves in a more clear or more interesting manner, a more engaging manner uh, for uh, a literary or considered audience. And I believe that uh, people are uh, capable of that uh, at the deepest level. That's part of our commitment, uh, as it were. Uh, 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 and it's also, it's not purely a poetry group, and I was kind of leaned heavily enough towards that, given a couple of the members. Uh, but I believe uh, uh, in my creative writing practice uh, with students in the college or educational practice and with a cooperative that poetry is like talking, in a sense. By which I mean that I don't think poetry belongs to an elite academy or an elite school. Uh, I believe the means to poetry are in our everyday speech. One of my very first uh, introductory classes to students will be around that notion in a way. That poets take 
uh, uh, typical things that we use in speaking. We all speak rhythmically, for example, in a rising and falling cadence. Uh, uh, we all use metaphors or similes to pepper our speech and make it more interesting or to help explain something uh, and so on. So that all these elements are heightened in the art of poetry, but they all have a natural foundation in everyday speech practice, as it were. So we are poets in ways without realizing we are to a degree. We just want to pull all together and heighten it and intensify it in a way, and we call that poetry. So I'd leave everyone, so not to frighten them off, that it's some grand concept up there that we can all uh, participate. Anyway, I will say more about that and some of my notions or ideas about creativity. But before that, I'm going to read you a, a first poem, which I have to say I was, I was at the moment that's described in this poem. And this poem is from Jarena Jennings, uh, who's one of our long-term uh, members in the Carlo Writers Cooperative. Uh, she would primarily say that poetry helps her to make sense of her life. She has no other ambition in a way for her poetry than that. Uh, in a sense, it's about trying to comprehend uh, difficult things often and articulate them. Now, she joined us this year when we went on, well, it's last year now, uh, I think in two years, if you know what I mean, because I'm an academic and think across a term. <laughs> so, uh, 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 anyway, uh, uh, last September, although strictly speaking, that may not be true, but anyway, that's just to see if you're awake. Calvin says, oh, yeah, yeah, Derek, I've got you there now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 she joined us last September on a trip we made to Illinois, the USA, where we have uh, 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 contacts. I'll talk more about that maybe later on. And we went up to Chicago and we visited the famous uh, Chicago Art Institute where she saw something there she had a longing to see for a very long time and that's what she articulates in the poem and I have to say what she's saying here is very real I was there I led her to this particular work she was fine in a way and I was there when the moment happened and it was a very emotional uh, moment so uh, here's Darina's poem which she calls section 144 her first encounter was a Dublin poster shop the movement in images he created caught her. Poetry in brushstroke, colour, symbol. To her, a language she understood. She was taken. She mapped out a train ride to see his work, his windows at Mites and Rhine's cathedral, cathedrals, his paintings in Paris and Berlin, but over time, life ate at her travel plans. Thirty years later, she arrived, heavy-legged from the heat of Chicago's streets, still longing to see a creation of his close up. She rested by the grand staircase, studied a floor plan, then made her way to section 144. And there they were. Their glow washed the floor in blues and greens. Chagall. Moving step by step, she examined each pane, filled her body with light, floating, transforming time and space. She washed herself in luminous colour. It's a reference to the famous Chagall windows, a very deep blue uh, in... Uh, and uh, uh, I think it's a wonderful poem uh, and uh, I was there at the moment it was created and in a way it's, it, it's been given birth to uh, through the cooperative and its uh, action. So it, it's, it's, it's one of our beliefs about creativity. The good or the bad news is this, uh, uh, creative psychologists or psychologists who study creativity believe that humans who devote uh, 10,000 hours to a particular craft can become uh, elite performers, if you like, of this craft. So this counters the notion, perhaps left to us by the Romantics, I would argue, uh, that, uh, uh, um, that, that, that poetry is the creation of, 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 of some elite genius, some, some person especially gifted by nature, or that music is the product of our Beethoven and Mozart, and that these were especially special human beings. But a certain amount of evidence uh, would suggest that actually uh, persistence over time 
uh, uh, leads to creative production. Now the point would be that Mozart and Beethoven's fathers were both musicians. Uh, they learned how to play music from a very young age and they put in their 10,000 hours and more by the time they had achieved uh, a certain age and so on. It uh, would be roughly the idea. But with that idea in mind then, we're saying that, that, that elite performance is not the preserve of an elite actually but that anyone who puts in sufficient effort and practice. Uh, Pele is born on the streets of Brazil. Uh, he puts in his 10,000 hours as a young boy or whatever, and he gets better and better. I'm sure he has some genetic inheritance that helps him as well, but it's a lot of his practice and hard work makes it uh, possible in some uh, way. So that's our belief. Uh, and the key then is what uh, uh, creates in people this conscientiousness, as we might call it, this diligence to keep at the task. And that's actually the question that intrigues uh, psychologists interested in creativity. How do some people become inspired to put in their 10,000 hours uh, and so on? And that's the question that they're currently uh, studying in some way. So I believe against the romantics actually, what we might call the tyranny of the romantic genius, uh, uh, that we can all put in our work, uh, our time and be productive. And there are famous examples of this. Uh, uh, again against the romantic notion of creation. Tchaikovsky uh, interested me a number of years ago for several reasons uh, 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 but I'm interested in creative personalities and, and Tchaikovsky whilst he had a natural gift for music also practiced very hard but he worked for commission you know he, he wasn't uh, uh, like Wordsworth uh, inspired walking across the dales and hills of the Lake District of England and some beautiful moment uh, uh, inspired him. He had a date in the diary where the Tsar or his people uh, needed a ballet for Christmas and that's when the job had to be done. And the striking thing is that Swan Lake and the Nutcracker, beloved uh, 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 ballets around the world, uh, were actually wrote, written for commission. Uh, 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 he wrote them to order uh, to please the Tsar. I can't remember which one was first, I think it was quite possibly Swan Lake. Tsar was so pleased with that. Uh, second Christmas comes around after, he says, I want another one of those. And uh, Tchaikovsky liked to check the first time it was a good Christmas present. Uh, he said, I'll go with that again. And he sat down and he wrote The Nutcracker and so on. But I've studied many artists that interest me. Caravaggio is another one. Uh, we all know a brilliant uh, Baroque painter who um, changed the face of Western art. It's worth bearing in mind that nearly every painting apart from the very early ones of Caravaggio's were all commissions uh, they were commissioned by the church uh, he painted for a job the, the remarkable thing was how he took the basic commission and worked it in a very creative way often startling those who had commissioned uh, uh, the portrait very interesting man Caravaggio you'd probably hate him because he, he was uh, quite a quite a character uh, but he, he's certainly very interesting to read about uh, I can't remember which church it was but he famously painted the Virgin uh, uh, on her deathbed which as a good Catholic who believes she assumed without dying into heaven was a bit of a mystery to me I still have to figure out the theology of that one but there is a painting by Caravaggio on the death of the Virgin uh, but literally the dead body of the Virgin on the, on, on, in the shroud was uh, a hooker basically that had been dragged down with the timer a couple of weeks uh, earlier and everybody knew that and this caused a bit of a stir uh, when Caravaggio's uh, painting was unveiled on the wall of a church at that point it was too late and the job was done but that's the type of character he was and he responded to uh, commission and if we want to go to Arguably, some might say one of the great uh, writers of Western culture, uh, Shakespeare, uh, often wrote very much for his audience and to please them in a way. Uh, he writes uh, Henry IV, Part One, which is a very brilliant play. And like any good writer looking for a check, uh, he turned around and wrote uh, Henry IV, Part Two, uh, when he thought he might have an audience for that one. And typical to Police Academy One, Two, Three, Four, Five, and Six, uh, Part Two was not as good as Part One, uh, even with Shakespeare. Uh, let it be said. So. Uh, uh, that's worth bearing in mind. But also, I, I, I think of older traditions, and I'm sure we're familiar with those uh, in Sweden too, uh, schools of medieval uh, craftsmen who uh, very brilliantly uh, develop their craft over time and are often anonymous artists uh, who've bequeathed their work to history and so on. And uh, many Renaissance painters worked in schools and so on. So I believe it's possible for humans to collaborate, collaborate uh, in creative groups and work together and uh, rise each other up. I think of two cities where uh, uh, moments like this existed. Under certain conditions, uh, 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 creativity can be heightened. Vienna, uh, 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 in the time of uh, uh, Haydn, 
Mozart and Beethoven is one particularly interesting place to see uh, so much creative genius expressed in one place. And this is where the Marxist materialist in me emerges who believes that things are produced under particular conditions. Uh, 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 19th century Vienna and earlier 18th to 19th century Vienna being one. But closer to our own experience and to mine as an Irish person, uh, Belfast in the 60s, which was in the middle of a type of civil war, and I don't recommend that uh, for what it produces uh, creatively. But in poetry, we had Seamus Heaney, who won the Nobel Prize, uh, gifted to him by the Swedish Academy in 1995. We also have Michael Longley, Derek Mahan, very fine poets, some of the finest poets actually writing in English uh, today, or up until recently, Heaney passed away in 2013. Uh, but there are others, uh, 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 Belfast Maeve McGuckian, Kieran Carson, Paul Muldoon, currently Professor of Creative Writing at Princeton, all emerged in Belfast uh, in that period and produced some of the most exciting poetry uh, being written in the English-speaking world. But all from one place and uh, within a space of uh, 20 years, uh, 30 years. So it is my humble belief that if we uh, set off something in Carlo and we keep at it over time, we might be able to generate a sort of school of Carlo poetry, if I can say that, or something like this, uh, if we uh, uh, believe in it enough. And uh, there will be a Tranos school of poetry, whatever about the Carmarthen uh, school of poetry. And we all know the Canadians are onto this already, uh, and they've been uh, doing it all along. But that's uh, 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 at the core of our, uh, my belief uh, in how creativity might work uh, in a community or a place at any given time. But anyway, after that I might read uh, another poem just to uh, keep things moving along. This is from my good friend uh, Phelan Kavna, who uh, left school at 16. His father was very ill and was customary at the time. He was the only, uh, eldest and only son uh, and uh, he was just about, I think actually technically under, I shouldn't be saying this because I think they're recording it, but hey, he was legally just under the limit by a couple of months of local circumstances and understanding uh, the Garda Siakana and the principal Garda Siakana had been the police officer uh, 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 who would be responsible in the local area uh, and the principal came to an agreement that he could leave school just under uh, the legal age of uh, 16 to uh, help out the family farm. So that's Phelan's circum uh, circumstances uh, and he writes really beautiful poetry and uh, he came to the cooperative uh, with some very rudimentary things on paper and we've worked together over a number of years now and uh, Phelan joined us also in Illinois last year, which I know was a huge uh, trip from. Uh, he lives in a place called Kilrush, which is about maybe 10 kilometers south of Carlos, technically in County Wexford. It's another county, but it's up in a very beautiful uh, part of Ireland on a good day. Always reminds me of uh, a David Hockney landscape. Any of you know those, those colorful fields and so on. Uh, it's really nice. Anyway, uh, one of the prompts we did for uh, uh, American visitors from Illinois came to us just recently there in June. Uh, we wanted to engage with US culture uh, in some way. And one of the prompts I proposed, and I will talk about our prompting process in due course, was that we look at some sections of a poem by Walt Whitman, the great American poet of the 19th century, who I believe to be the poetic prophet of the US. And like any great prophet and poet, he is still ahead of us still ahead of the US and I still think he's calling the US always to its better sense of itself would be my view and I think we all can appreciate why this might be particularly important at this juncture uh, in time. The amazing thing is I read my Whitman-esque in uh, Pan Thai the other night which is a very different poem than what uh, Phelan uh, uh, took from the same Whitman prompt and this is the fascinating thing when he puts something out to people how people respond in so many different ways and could produce very diverse and interesting work. Uh, here's uh, Phelan's poem, and I think you'll appreciate the angle. I wish for my wife we were horses. In Washington, the trees are falling. It is the dawn of something, and I am shivering. Congressmen are saying things. Reporters are saying things. If the congressmen were Pintos and reporters Andalusian, the rest of us piebald mixes are black and white. Would we weep for our sins or kneel to police in Chicago? Black Shires, black Frisians, black Marwari kneeling. Would we suffer angst of owning 
or feel entitled to anything. If we were horses for a while, we could regain our health, then become human again. My wife could wear her Tabasco dress, layers of ruffles swaying, dahlias in her hair, smiling. But in Washington, legislators will not bow their heads. Their eyes do not darken in friendship like the heavy white horses that gallop to a fence, glad to have come, but frightened because the trees are falling. So from Fela Kavna there, all the way from Kilrush County, Wexford, uh, and so on. So the heart of the cooperative, I believe, and this is the model I propose to the writing community, which is somewhat scattered, although talking to itself in Tranos, uh, uh, the heart of the cooperative and its endeavours over two years is that notion of conscientiousness, keeping at it. So over a 10 year period now, we have met without fail, fortnightly, during the school term. So from September through to June, allowing for national school holidays, primary, secondary and further education, we meet every fortnight on a Monday night for roughly a two hour period and we never miss. I went once to a conference in Belgium and I appointed Simon Lewis uh, to deputise for me, but I got off the train or the bus in Carlo at about quarter to nine and I said, you know what, <laughs> the cooperative is up in the chalk right now. I think I'll go up and say hello. And I couldn't resist uh, even turning up then. Uh, and I did. I didn't have a poem, but I just wanted to check they were still working and that they were doing it and they weren't lying to me. Uh, so we work very hard and we're consistent over time. And I actually believe that's the reason for our success. Now, we're not a, 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 a purely a reading group. We do readings but we are a critique meeting and we take seriously uh, the uh, 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 grown-up critique, I should say, of the writing of our members. Now, we're respectful of sensitivities. We do really appreciate that you made your little baby and you're bringing them in and putting them on the table. And I know this as much as any of the members, I have to say, how sensitive and hard that can be to have others poking about and say, why did you put those shoes on it? And that's a terrible haircut you gave that child. <laughs> uh, that sort of thing. I think you should have done something else. And we're very attentive to that. We, we, we take uh, uh, what's held to be honest critique that is in no way personal, would not tolerate at all a single note of feeling somebody was having a go with someone else through the disguise of the critique. But we will welcome what is held to be honest opinion. Now, members are entitled, it's their child after all, to maybe go back and reconsider the haircut or the shoes, but that decision is entirely theirs. Uh, but that's the spirit in which we operate, and it has to be kind of honest in order to bring people uh, along. So I think that's the uh, heart of the cooperative uh, in uh, many ways. Now, the prompts have helped us as well. Maybe I'll talk more about them, though, in due course. Now, at the political level, because uh, politics is inescapable, uh, uh, we, after a year or two, did formulate a constitution to the groans of some, and uh, 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 then the notion of a yearly AGM. Now, that's the only point at which we really get most obviously political. But I do have to say, after several uh, mini crises, uh, nothing compared to the crash of 2008 or anything like that, or any major personal crisis you might undergo, but like any group of people getting together, we've had our moments along the way. And I do have to say that the wisdom of formulating our vision and a set of practices by which we agree to run our organization was a wise move early on, because we can always resort back to our constitution and at key points along the way, and this is how we've operated, and we can always claim then uh, we have acted fairly, we've acted in the interests of the cooperative, and we have abided by our common rules of engagement that we've accepted. Now, every year at the AGM, we're entitled uh, to, or every member is entitled to review the constitution, to either, uh, to ask for some form of constitutional amendment, either to withdraw something from the constitution or to add something to it. And in the light of the year's experience, uh, we have occasionally, we have a committee, treasurer, director, myself, last couple of years, uh, a treasurer and uh, a secretary, 
uh, and we meet a couple of times during the year just to keep things moving along, often after the meeting or sometimes through informal chats and stuff like that. The actual constitution and one yearly AGM, it can seem like a drag, we're all there to write and so on, but to keep the organisation straight and to keep us uh, focused and to add an element of formality to it, I believe that has been very important. One other thing I would add to that is uh, we don't meet in anyone's house, right? We don't meet in any cosy kind of coterie in a way. We meet in a public house upstairs in a private room, which would be a sort of a legitimate enough place for a cooperative or political organisation to meet in Ireland. I'm sure you might have similar context. I believe that has been very important. Now, the fact we had a constitution was important for getting uh, public funding, which we've secured on a number of occasions. The fact that we've been consistent over a number of years and have delivered on our objectives and we have a semi-formal structure uh, has allowed us to access public funds. And I believe that like semi-public uh, dimension of our existence is very important to that. So it's, that's an important part of the model, uh, Peter. You know, It can't be just a coterie of friends. Now, we've been tough. I mean, some people joined us for a couple of years and found the pace a bit serious in a way and heavy for them and they opted out in the end and so on that's all good as far as we're concerned uh, once we've managed this in a, you know in a way abiding with our constitution and so on and so forth we're not saying it's for everybody we're very serious about what we're doing but we are welcoming of serious people who wish to grow and engage with writing in a serious way and get better at what they're doing over time and are willing to put in the work right uh, the creative work that needs to be uh, put in there so that's uh, been very important now our local community has been very supportive and I think that's also because of the type of organisation that we have. Uh, Carlow County Library, I have to say from early on, we have a very good library system in Ireland. They uh, uh, funded a tutor to join us at one point for a project. Uh, we uh, did a radio programme that was recorded as part of Carlow Arts Festival a couple of years ago, uh, which they helped tutor us and prepare us for and gave us the space to do the re live recording in. Uh, they have been a, a great ally of the uh, cooperative. Now we've brought a couple of readings and events back to them as well as a sort of uh, payoff for what they've done us. That's just good politics as well. Uh, we've been uh, attentive to our obligations, shall we say, to those who have assisted us along the way. We've he hosted events in the Choc, the Balmel Perry came and read with us there once. The Choc Dolmen's where we regularly meet, free of charge. I must thank Willie Rath of Choc <laughs> uh, here in Sweden and his uh, son David uh, and, and Anthony Byrne actually was the manage, house manager there. And many years they've given us a heated room in the winter uh, on a Monday night free of charge, but we have brought back a couple of events to them. Uh, we had a great poetry slam with McHenry County College in 2015, for example, which many of their staff and lots of the public enjoyed, and that was a great night upstairs in the Chopped Almonds. So we were working with the community, uh, rather like the festival here in Toronto, so let it be said, uh, but you bring a crowd to people and they give you a venue and all that sort of thing, as Irish men maybe call them. We appreciate that. I'm sure the Welsh get that too, and the Canadians. Uh, good old fashioned, uh, uh, help your neighbour, help you. It's partly how the cooperative model works, so that we all benefit in the long run. That's the model uh, and the aim. Recently, we have a relationship with Visual Carlo, which is a national. Uh, uh, visual centre uh, which is luckily for us uh, located in the heart of Carlow Town. Uh, it's a national and international uh, 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 site for new art. Uh, it's a wonderful building. Uh, Mel's probably been there and uh, others uh, but we've had wonderful readings there uh, uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, we've stretched out internationally. Uh, well Carlow College which is where I work uh, also on the grounds uh, of the library and visual uh, 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 we have international connections with the US there, with Community College System, McHenry County College in Illinois, and uh, Elgin Community College, which we visited in September. So we, we, but that was our generosity too. We've welcomed members that have been on exchange in Carlow College to join us for a term. We built up friendships and relationships, and that was all reciprocated in the tradition of good human hospitality and exchange and uh, that's all worked very fruitfully i think for everybody uh, involved and i i our cafe fusion in wexford was how i established the wexford connection which brought the welsh to us and then brought the swedish irish man uh, colum uh, o'kiernan to us uh, eventually and we we're uh, building our links i hope with carmarthen and the writers there and cultivira here in tranos in sweden uh, laterally i i really hope so we, we've, we've produced an anthology, we've done a radio program, we've done dramatised readings, we've participated in the Carlo Arts Festival on a number of occasions, we've done uh, poetry slams, more formal readings, uh, and so on. But 
So one thing we do in, in keeping people busy and focused, I mean, it's my other challenge to ideas of, of creativity that are out there. Uh, we've all probably encountered this precious notion, it seems to me, that, uh, oh, I'm an artist, uh, don't tell me what to do. Uh, I know what I have to say and how I'm going to do things. And again, it seems this notion to me is rather precious and perhaps an inheritance of the romantic legacy. The romantics give us a lot, I teach romantics and I really love them but they have a very particular view of how art is produced and I just think it's quite frankly wrong and <laughs> or has its limits and there are other ways to do things. Uh, but this notion that uh, art is precious, uh, 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 I may say and they're not here, but you know, uh, uh, we've done a number of projects over a number of years and I listen very carefully to a co cooperative, to our cooperative, even as I'm somewhat directive, as I'm the director too in ways. Uh, and I was sort of hearing, oh, we've done a lot of projects now. Can we have some space to just do our own thing? So I, as any astute leader, I hope, would do, I responded to that and I gave the group space to suddenly find that the sounds of silence seem to be the favourite tune <laughs> uh, uh, because they're suddenly strikingly unproductive when they have nothing to do and no project before them, uh, uh, I discover. So that actually is my experience uh, in ways that when we have projects that keep us engaged, I have discovered that the cooperative is actually most productive and keeps at the task in a way. Uh, you know, if Caravaggio had no money for his dinner uh, because he decided not to paint for a few weeks, he was uninspired, he would starve. Suddenly found that he was busy painting and feeling very inspired, uh, so he <laughs> could, uh, you know, carouse the tavernas of the various Italian cities that he lived in. Uh, so we've responded to a number of engagements over the years. One of the first, uh, uh, which people found very strange at the time, was uh, it was an artist who I, I, I could say very strongly how, how I felt about that installation, but since I've been recorded here, I won't actually <laughs> say that. But anyway, uh, a Visual took on uh, an installation uh, by a nationally renowned Irish artist uh, who was going on to represent Ireland in the uh, Venice Biennale, actually. And he was starting to respond uh, to a local notion or story, which one is a good idea. And in the county of Carlo, there's uh, a, an old monastic settlement uh, called St. Mullins. It's actually very beautiful if you come and visit Carlo. I think Mel and we've been down there, haven't we? Uh, St. Mullins. But in a medieval Irish poem called uh, Bulla Hivna, which translates, Heaney actually translated in 1983 as Sweeney Astray, it's sometimes translated more scholarly as the madness of Sweeney. It, it's about the, the poem is a sort of fragmented medieval poem about the encounter of St. Ronan, one of the early Christians in Ireland, and the pagan king Sweeney. And Sweeney is annoyed to hear the sound of church bells on his land and he discovers St. Ronan and his monks uh, building uh, churches and in a moment of uh, a peak he grabs uh, Ronan's Psalter and he throws it in the lake and uh, St. Ronan curses him then to take to the trees of Ireland as the mad Sweeney. Uh, he has a man's or a human's consciousness but he has the form of a bird. And then he flies all over Ireland and actually up to Scotland, believe it or not. I don't think he takes in our Welsh brethren or cousins, but he goes up to Scotland for a while and he travels around with all his various experiences and so on. And there's some wonderful moments uh, in that poem, even as it's kind of fragmented and stuff. But anyway, this is a prompt. I thought it was great because we've Seamus Heaney, we have uh, a poem and all that, but foisting a poem from medieval Irish, albeit translated into strong and good contemporary English, upon uh, people who haven't encountered before uh, was something of a shock to the system, uh, but we persisted. And the remarkable thing is that several years later, these poems come out. They were read in Illinois and people got them and so on. And we actually think we did something more interesting than the artist, to be perfectly honest. And I actually don't think that's arrogance on our part. Uh, so that was one of the prompts. In my more literary mode, I thought it would be a good idea because it was somewhat afoot in the UK at some point in the mid-90s. Uh, uh, Ted Hughes, you might recall, returned to his tales uh, from Ovid. There was a return to Ovid, that classical strain that never disappears in Western writing. Uh, I know Ivan Boland, Carol Ann Duffy, uh, I'm sure some Welsh poets were in that bag as well, did a sort of after Ovid anthology and so on. Uh, our own great contemporary, Michael Longley, who's a student of classics, has continually responded to the classics in his work and has produced some really uh, wonderful material. So anyway, I decided to go to that uh, great bag of tricks that inspired Geoffrey Chaucer and William Shakespeare and uh, some of uh, Shakespeare's contemporaries, uh, Christopher, uh, his name won't come to mind, Marlowe, there we go, Christopher Marlowe, Shakespeare's great rival, uh, were inspired by this as well. And uh, here's a poem that grew out of the tale of uh, Narcissus and Echo. And this is my colleague, 
uh, Simon Lewis, who again joined us very early in the cooperative, I'd say. I have a memory of uh, Simon probably wandering in about 2009, so he's been with us many years. And uh, Simon has gone on from really uh, just uh, baby steps in the early days of the cooperative. Uh, he won in 2015 the Hennessy Award for Best Irish Poetry and he is the first member of the cooperative who has published his collection. I'm pretty confident more are coming and on the way, but he published uh, last year uh, his first collection with Dura Press. We're an emerging but uh, 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 significant press, I think, in Irish poetry, a collection that uh, he called Jewtown. Simon is Jewish, a rare enough uh, uh, type of figure in Irish uh, uh, life and ways, well, certainly today anyway. And uh, he wrote a series of poems about the Jewish community in Cork, they had come in at the end of the 19th century, uh, fleeing the Russian pogroms, as we know, and many Jewish people uh, fled to the US. And the local joke is that they mistook Fort Cork for New York, and they ended up in Cork, Ireland. And when they landed, sort of got out into the community, they said they'd stay a while, it wasn't too bad. And he has traced his family down to Clownus, a town in Lithuania. So this is from his collection, Jewtown, as it was eventually published, but it grew from a prompt we presented to the group from uh, the Narcissus and Echo story in Ovid. And again, on a first reading, one mightn't get that connection. But the poem is called Echo. Every day I shut the door and push my cart past the markets up Albert Quay. I watch the greying herds of common garb, walking sticks and cycles humming by until you come dilly-dallying down the street, a bouquet draped in violet, mauve or green. In April, you stopped. Your hands reached to pick a bunch of daffodils. A shilling, you asked, and all I wanted to tell you were the names of every flower in the world and how we'd fill vases with yellows, blues, purples in all the rooms of the house I'd build. I had waited. All I needed were the words. A shilling, I said, and lost you in the herds. It's from uh, Simonson's, uh, Simon's collection there. Uh, and uh, that was from one of our prompts. That was our Ovid prompt. We also responded to Easter 1916. You'll hear some poems about that in due course. Uh, we responded to Yates 2015, which I think brought us to Wexford as well, where we met some people from the residency here. And laterally, we've responded to US culture in various ways for our trips to the US. You'll hear more about those uh, coming along, or, or as I go along. Well, tell you what, I might read you another poem. What do you think? Will I read one of my own? Yes, Will yes, I do that? Yes. Why not? Uh, so I'll read one of these. This was one of my prompts uh, to the US. Uh, idea. So I read a very good book, actually it was a very good book, on the Irish in America. Uh, and I read there about the figure, uh, I, I mentioned this, I wouldn't normally, but you know, we're poetic intimates here as it were, uh, uh, a figure called Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, who was an Irish-American lady uh, who was a socialist and communist and uh, radical really about women's rights in the US as well as workers' rights. And she has the great distinction of being buried in Russia. Uh, which is interesting uh, these days. Uh, and I was struck really, my image for her is there's a wonderful photograph of her in black and white up on a platform. Uh, she's her hands aloft, uh, uh, dressed in, in a woman's garb of the 1920s, speaking to a crowd of bowler hatted and straw hatted men, uh, an entire field of men. And that woman has them in the palm of her hand as she's speaking to them. Uh, I do make a very Irish comparison here. Uh, this would be uh, everyone in Ireland, I think, would know this. This is one of our cultural assumptions. I compare her to uh, uh, a figure from Ireland's great socialist period of striking and so on. Uh, I don't know if you know of a guy we call Big Jim Larkin. You'll find a statue on a Collins Street in Dublin with his hands aloft, actually, rather like her, addressing the crowd. And he was responsible for leading, anyway, the great lockout, as it was known, of 1913, where he protested against William Murphy. Uh, the great businessman who owned a lot of businesses in Ireland uh, and led out his workers on strike uh, for months and months and months. Uh, uh, Larkin didn't like Murphy and I'm happy to say neither did William Butler Yeats uh, who wrote several poems uh, protesting against him. September uh, 1913 being one of them. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's all you need to know. These are part of my Carlo poems as I call them. 
it's relatively long, but it's story-like, so I think you'll follow it fairly easily, I hope. Uh, one other thing I should say is, uh, on the edge of Carlo, there's, well, there's a town called Tullo, which would be the sensible uh, next principal town in Carlo, uh, uh, second town. But on the edge of it's this massive uh, Celtic tiger, uh, 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 Mount Wolseley, it's called. It's, it, it, any of our US would think of Dallas. For a brief period, Irish people thought they were going to live like J.R. Ewing, and uh, oil was going to flow, uh, 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 and we were all going to be rich and live like kings. Uh, so Mount Wolseley is out there uh, on Tullow. That's all you probably need to know about that. Uh, and this is my comment on uh, contemporary society, in a way. Anyway, Carlo poem number 33. Malloy had intended thinking about God, but found himself instead contemplating the remarkable sticking power of dog shite. The way it gets into the grooves of your sneakers to the point where it is virtually impossible to remove. A most stubborn fact of modern life. The situation was not helped by another fact. He had only one eye and he hobbled around on a crutch because he had only one leg. He held the crutch with the one arm he had on the side of his body opposite to his one good leg. In this manner he made his way daily through the streets of Tullow. It did not help either that the town's one main street consisted of a very steep hill. He'd walk into the town every day from out the Carlo Road, seeking his 20 John Players Blue and the Irish Times. Malloy particularly admired the optimism of those who produced the endless reams of paper. To think humanity capable of that much thought was surely a cause for rejoicing. And the sheer fact of the very openness of windows particularly astonished him. Such daring to open out into the world, a type of invitation one could scarcely resist. And this was why he garnered a reputation around the town for being nosy, or a little weird, depending on your point of view. Manny's the woman raised her head from washing the kitchen floor to find him gawking in the window and she'd have to shush him away like some lean tom cat. As for the audacity of doors, they're standing guard over acres of secrecy. They always made him angry. For these reasons, he found it very difficult to live in a house. This was the how and the why of his becoming a rambling troubadour, most likely to be found sleeping in a derelict house with no doors and no windows either. At least such as these type of things are commonly understood. He'd hobble over the bridge into town every day, his crutch carved with serpents, the caduceus curved around its spine, its twin head looking left, looking right, while he tried to dodge the traffic heading out to Mount Wolseley, the land cruisers, the range rovers, those tanks. He'd mutter to himself, there's the gift of the gab and there's the gift of the gab. I'd like to think of her as the women's answer to Big Jim Larkin, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, on top of the wooden platform addressing the hordes of bowler-hatted men and the occasional scattered gent dressed in his straw boater. He'd seen the picture in an exhibition in the local library once, and now he carried it in his mind's eye, metaphorically pinned to his jacket the way youngsters wear labels these days. She's there to talk about workers' rights and justice for the poor men and women of Patterson, New Jersey, not long in from Latvia, Lithuania, Liverpool and Longford. By God, she knows how to raise the spirits with hope. She preaches the gospel of the brotherhood of men, the sisterhood of women. By God, where are the women gone? the women like that. Just as he had this thought, he was struck by a black Range Rover coming around the corner at considerable speed. He didn't know what hit him. <clears throat> so 
there we go. So the cooperative was sort of founded with a notion too of challenging, I think, the individualism and narcissism, as I think of, of it, of our contemporary society with the notion of kind of local collective action. It seems to me actually quite a hard thing to realise, but inspired very much by that 19th century model. The notion that we share certain common resources that we can bring together that enhances a collective aim uh, within a community. So in that sense, it's kind of countercultural and it has a political dimension. I also consider calling it a collective as inspired by modernist notions of manifestos. We've never quite written one, and we've never probably been quite political in the way that I would like us to be, but we have been uh, indirectly in ways. Now, I've also realized too, in organizing any collective of humans, it's damn difficult, I'm not going to say that, and at times one might lose whatever hair one has, and all the rest of it with frustration at the notion of pulling people together to achieve an end. But despite that, we have uh, persisted. Uh, great gifts to the cooperative have been our trip to the US, uh, uh, trips like this to Cultivira and to meet like-minded folk from around Europe and uh, further afield, which is great. Uh, but for example, in Carlow College this year, we will have a, a writer in residence, a poet in residence is joining us for the first term, uh, we have a very enlightened uh, president of the college. And uh, uh, this, I don't think, would have happened if the collective hadn't, uh, the crop cooperative hadn't got up uh, and running. And he will work with the community in Carlow to develop uh, creative writing as well as students within the college. And this was, again, never one of the intentions of the cooperative to achieve that end, but somehow it had happened along the way. And that's often how it goes. So I set down a, a challenge uh, to uh, Tranos, really. Right, uh, uh, I know Peter is very interested in writing, as is Magnus, a uh, cultural magnet of the region and font of much knowledge. Uh, but I've uh, seen the members of the uh, 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 spoken word community uh, come together and perform in Ban Thai. So I know that there's sufficient people interested if they were to come together on a weekly basis. Maybe they could meet next week. I'd be happy to sit in with some of them. Let's make it immediate and not purely notional. If we can find a time in the schedule, right, and we have a first meeting, an inaugural meeting of the Tranos Writers Cooperative, or whatever it might be, right, and I will be there as an honorary guest director just to establish the first meeting. I throw down that challenge, and people bring their writing uh, for critique, uh, but I also set down a prompt. And the prompt I suggest is uh, the man on the motorcycle there on the main street, right? So it's quite embodied, it's quite concrete. People pass it every day and they have their thoughts about it. So what would you write in response to that? Maybe Magnus and uh, Peter might set up a Facebook group and we can communicate with all of those people and we can find the time and the place. And I'm quite happy to meet maybe upstairs in that very beautiful cafe run by the German family called... Tipperland. Tipperland, is it? Yeah, that would be a lovely space to meet in, I think, if nice coffee. Uh, and I suggest that in the course of next week, maybe we have our first uh, meeting there. I'm going to read one or two poems more just to finish, I think, because uh, time runs on and literally did one thing. I know we, 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 we started a little late. I, I, I had planned to read the full story. Now, it's only two pages, but I don't think I'll read that at this stage. Actually, you know what? I'm going to put that story aside because I read a, a sort of narrative poem. I'll read two poems, uh, maybe a little bit of that story, and one final poem, maybe. One of our uh, 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 prompts was, we went through a, a, an anniversary year last year in Ireland, 2016, which anniversary of very important rebellion in Irish history, uh, Easter 1916, about which Yeats wrote his wonderful poem, and uh, maybe many people are familiar with that. It was the beginning of the process, we'd be inclined to say now, that eventually led to the founding of what was called the Free State for a time, uh, in 1922, but we would argue it started that far uh, back. So we wanted prompts that were in no way uh, tinged by the green, white and gold and weren't jingoistic in any way and maybe to find the humanity in that moment. So one of our members, Pauline Flynn, who has worked much of her life as a visual artist, uh, who has latterly been seeing the light on the road to Damascus and realised poetry <laughs> is great. I work with words, I paint my pictures that way. Uh, this is Pauline's poem in response to that. Pauline joined us in um, Illinois last year as well. Now her poem is called Chanter, which is one of the elements of the Irish Illum pipes, which are the Irish type of bagpipes, although they are a superior instrument, and to compare them is just heresy. But anyway, <laughs> no Scots here. Uh, but they are a beautiful instrument when they're in tune. And uh, 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 Chanter is part of that. And she's referring here to uh, the figure of Eamon Kant, who was uh, one of the figures executed for his part in Easter 1916, who was also a fine Illin Piper. And it's really the love story between him and his wife, 
on your camp, Lee O'Brien. And the poem is from her point of view about her beloved husband and lover who was to die. So the poem is called Chanter. You were the man on the train, hurtling onward, your whistle sweet as a bird, a maker of sounds untethered, waning into the wild. You were shadow and light, rooted deep as a mountain, a scribe of fortune, with secrets and longings full to the brim. You were the man who walked into your dreams, gave me five francs of silver and gold so I could walk into mine. That's uh, Pauline on Eamon Kant. And, uh, and then our, uh, Clifton Redmond, who we recently visited Wales, a uh, fine poet, and Clifton has a fascinating story. I'm sure he wouldn't mind saying that here. He came to us uh, kind of writing a type of folk poetry in a way, not dismissing that, because it can be very beautiful and wonderful. And uh, he's from a small town in Carlow called Hackettstown. He had worked all his life, again, from about 16 years of age, uh, as a butcher uh, in a commercial slaughterhouse, so not the butcher who, on the high street type thing and a working man loves boxing and so on and he's writing this really beautiful poetry uh, i believe now in carlo uh, opening up new territory i think for irish poetry with a type of uh, blue collar experience in a way and i think that's a new and fresh voice there's politics involved in bringing that to the marketplace i think if we can say that or to uh, uh, poetry uh, in ireland and beyond uh, anyway, uh, 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 the prompt here was, uh, I brought uh, a prompt, I did one, a very different poem uh, about some of the children that died as such in the flat and the fallout of Easter 1916. Actually an undocumented story up until very recently. For all the historical work that had been done, uh, they had not looked at, uh, I think about 40 children uh, under 16 years of age were shot indirectly or got caught in various aspects of the melee, some very, very young, uh, a year or so. Uh, this poem is in memory of uh, Patrick Featherston, uh, uh, who was shot looting sweets from Noblet's sweet shop and was quite possibly shot under the order of James Connolly uh, that it would be a respectable rebellion and any looters would be shot on sight. It wasn't to break down into uh, civil disorder. It was a political rebellion after all. So he was shot by the Sinn Féin side, uh, so to speak, for looting a shop. So Paddy's Rebellion, in memoriam, Patrick Featherston, 1900 to 1916. Mammy, take your head out of the gash. You can't stop the ink spill. My story's written. Mammy, why are you on your knees, sobbing, a banshee kneeling on glass confetti? There is no me in that empty skin and bone bottle. I am elsewhere now, I am gone. Forget the arguments we had, your harsh words, hissing, cutting, crushing, me begging for a bag of sweets, just to see how sweet they tasted. But I had my day, running up Sackville Street, drunk with hope, to see the great glass frames of noblets, unprotected, blinded by the sight of cherry red stones, sapphire globes, orange suns dawning. And I ran with my loot, a silk purse of treasure, through the pushing crowds, mouth full of ecstasy, heart pulsing for the taste of freedom. And nothing would have stopped me. The smell of mortar shells and gunpowder, the crack fire of rifles, the hole in my leg. And I watched those little treasures I tasted for a moment dance away free along the concrete. Uh, and just, uh, uh, it's good to hear a, a female voice uh, and in a female way. I'll, I'll just read uh, two or three paragraphs briefly from a, a story called Uniform uh, by Lucy Gann, who's a primary school teacher. Uh, from Ferns County Wexford which in Irish terms means she's travelling quite a bit up to Carlow to meet the legendary cooperative she's heard so much about uh, and this is the dedication and focus uh, we have created uh, it's a wonderful little story again responding uh, to our US visit it gets that direction in the end we won't quite have uh, time to uh, go there in the end well one of our prompts was, was to respond to Marilyn Monroe uh, as an interesting figure what she might have meant to US culture 
and to American experience. So with that in mind, uh, image of woman and what she might represent and so on, you, you, you get where the story starts at least, uh, wherever I'm at. It's called Uniform by Lucy Gann. How could I admit to a gang of teenage girls that I hate the skin-tight, skimpy dresses which are the self-imposed, going-out uniform of our age group? Bodycon, short for body contouring, meaning they're so tight you look like you've been dropped into them from a great height. My problem is what to wear to the formal dance next week. If I don't wear the same kind of thing as the other girls, they'll say I'm weird. My mam goes mad about what she calls the overuse and inappropriate use of the word weird. She goes into a total rant about how calling each other weird at all times, all the time, affects people's self-esteem and mental health. She says that teenagers are at a stage of life where they have a burning need to fit in and when things are said that make them feel different and strange, it causes damage. They feel isolated and can be vulnerable to all types of bullying and intimidation. She's a real ray of sunshine, my mother. <laughs> my auntie's a dressmaker, and she says the clothing companies are laughing all the way to the bank at the moment. Think how much denim they save on skinny jeans, and how much fabric they save on short dresses and skimpy tops. <laughs> and don't get me started on wedding dresses with no sleeves, and most of them off the shoulder. They're making a fortune on what they save on fabric and sewing, she says. Aunt Jenny and my mom are sisters, so you can imagine when you get the two of them together in one room, it's Rant Central Station. I mean, intriguing story, but I, I, I leave you there. Uh, and I finish on a final uh, poem. I think I've said what I need to say there, and I look forward to exciting writing and developments in Tranos, as there is already, but continuing. This is... Um, Clifton responding to probably growing up in a rural Irish school uh, in the uh, uh, 1980s, I would say, with Clifton, uh, where it seems to me rather like how it was in the 1970s, but I won't get into how I was here, dubbed and a bit more cosmopolitan than there might have been in the Hackettstown, but I don't know. Uh, but at the end of this, I think Colin McKiernan will recognise, and actually maybe paradoxically our Welsh friends, the truth of this, uh, despite our nationalisms, uh, one can admire things in the other culture and we have this dual and complex reality and I think Clifton, uh, Clifton really captures this brilliantly I think anybody in Ireland and perhaps our Welsh colleagues will recognise the reality of this experience actually so he calls the poem an Irish lesson I remember fourth class in St Bridget's lined up like soldiers rows of navy uniforms baby blue shirts elastic neck ties. Mrs Duffy, aged as the classroom, old as the pipes that wrapped around the walls and rattled. Older than the desks, there's one of them down there in the corner, with wrought iron frames and timber tops, layer upon layer of tick varnish, carved out holes for inkwells. Two pictures hung on cold wet walls, the proclamation, its black and white circled faces, faded writing, the Virgin Mary with hands wide, a perfect vision of forgiveness. Standing at the top of the class, a face of cratched, scratched clefts and liver spots, a head of tossed grave springs, a bamboo cane in her skeletal hand. When she beat the blackboard, Shudders of chalk dust landed on the lip. As she gave us lessons, the stick slap kept time. Chanting or singing, Ta me, ta tu, ta she, ta she, a reach, a reach, a reach. We sat in our desks, mimicking the mad music she was making. I closed my eyes and dreamed of Anfield. Hillsborough, Wembley, drawing football circles on lined paper, a foreigner in her Catholic wasteland. She told me I should be ashamed. Men were stood against the wall and shot so I could speak my native tongue. Batty Duffy, beating the blackboard like a mad joke, chanting or singing, ta tu, 
ta 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 me ta tu ta she ta she arish 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 kiss and redman from harry They're very good thank you very much there you go. Which is uh, uh, again, again, again. Uh, that's your basic verb. I am an Irish. I am. I. Uh, uh, you are. She is. Whatever. Ta tu. Ta she. Ta me. Whatever. Anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Taxamicket, Derek. Taxamicket. Uh, I, 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 I've heard that poem. I've heard Clifton read that poem in Swansea, in Wales, and he would be honoured, I'm sure, to hear that wonderful delivery of it here in in, in Sweden. It's uh, it's a wonderful poem. The whole presentation was wonderful. The, the, so many things resonate with me. Um, it's wonderful to hear Clifton. The poem about the children lost in 1916 really got me there. It was wonderful, yeah, wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you've spoken about Tronos and the idea of this wonderful community, this literary community that we've met and we've engaged with and we've heard performing and we. we, we We've, we've joined in with Pilsner Poesy and we know that they can perform, but this idea that they can come together more regularly and write together, I'm sure lots of people who are there in Tiverland on, on, on Saturday morning, <coughs> writing to a prompt, were enjoying themselves, loved that experience. Uh, I'm, I'm so glad that you, you've offered that opportunity to, to move with that again and, and, and take that further. That would be a great, a great result um, for, from, from the residency and for what we want to try and achieve within this this wonderful wonderful town um, thank you all for, for gathering here today and thank you so much to, to Derek Horace.